This is Join Us in France, episode 24. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And we welcome you to the Join Us in France travel podcast. Elise is a professional tour guide, art historian, and a really good storyteller. Yakety yak. On today's show, Elise tells us about Bastille Day. As you may know, Bastille Day is on July 14th in France. As a matter of fact, we call it Le 14 Juillet. We don't call it Bastille Day at all. It's, we call it the 14th of July. Um, I'm going to really need this episode, at least because I know oh, about zero about this subject. <laughs> well, you actually probably know more than you think you know. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll start at the beginning, which right, is always right. where that's I good, like that's to good. start. Because somehow, you know, I went to school in France, but... Didn't I don't remember? Maybe I snoozed through it, which probably did. It's entirely possible, <laughs> but I don't remember ever being taught about this for some strange reason. But one thing I do know is that you shouldn't go looking for the Bastille Fortress today because it's gone. It's it got destroyed, and at this point, there's an outline on the pavement, which is kind of cool, you know. Yeah, you're doing my spoiler. Oh, sorry, Annie. sorry. Oh, sorry. But there's lots to see around that neighborhood and around Bastille Day. There are wonderful things to see and, and enjoy. So we'll have a little music and then we'll come back and talk about Bastille Day. Good. Okay, we're back to talk about Bastille Day. But before we get started, I have a short announcement. A little while back, uh, we had some requests for episodes, right? Yeah. So somebody asked us about Canal du Midi, which we've done. Your wish came true. And on the Facebook page, we got some feedback. Sarah and Joseph, they wanted us to talk about the southeast of France, the Riviera, and... We'll get there. We'll get there. The villages in Provence, there's so many of them. The problem there is there's just so right. many that it's hard to narrow it down. We're just going to have to take one or two and do a little bit at a time. You know, there's so much to talk about that we will never run out of things to talk about. Exactly. Now, Anne, also on the Facebook page, asked us about Dijon, mm -hmm. and we'll do that We're going to be doing that. Soon, probably in the fall, so we're not... Uh, forgetting about you. It's an unusual request, actually. It's not a place that lots of tourists go to, but... Unless they've uh, heard of Dijon mustard. That's <laughs> true, that's true. Um, Christy wanted us to talk about Montmartre. And, and we are we, going to. We are totally doing that very, very soon. So thank you for your feedback and suggestions. I don't want you to think we're ignoring them. We are actually uh, working towards um, uh, talking about all these places. But France... It's a small country, but there's lots to talk about. So we'll, we'll get to all of those. Okay? And if you want to offer more suggestions, go to the Facebook page, Join Us in France, and you can start reading and like us there. Or on Twitter, it's at Paris Podcast. All right. La Bastille. La Bastille. I wish I could yes. sing. I would sing, but I can't <laughs> sing. So you are going to all be spared out there, a <laughs> moment of misery. Um, Annie mentioned that we're going to do a podcast today about uh, Bastille Day. But actually what we're going to do is we're going to do a podcast about the Bastille. And uh, we're going to talk about the, the uh, history of the building and the place where it is. And, of course, uh, what, what happens there these days uh, because it's, it's all connected. And uh, it's interesting because as Annie is a hybrid americano Frencho, and, <laughs> and I am too, but in the other direction, <laughs> um, we, we both know that uh, for people who come from the United States, I'm not sure about people who come from England, but we consider it uh, that the 14th of July is Bastille Day. And, right. of course, the French have no idea what that is. And uh, the perfect example is 
uh, a few years ago, uh, one of my nephews came to visit and a very gregarious uh, teenager he was. And he was here in summertime in July and happened to be here on the 14th and walked over to a friend of mine who was French and shook that person's hand and said, happy Bastille Day. And <laughs> the person just looked at him and went, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> I was like, what, 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 what? Yeah. And I realized that, of course, we do call it that. And the French just call it Independence Day. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they don't. And, and I'll explain a little bit later on why and and why in fact the whole idea of connecting the 14th of July to uh, the story of the Bastille is uh, contentious still actually a little bit in France oh. so uh, let, let's begin at the beginning mm -hmm. um, uh, Bastille or Bastille is actually a fortification mm -hmm. very often built into ramparts Mm -hmm. And the uh, actual original name of the one we're referring to, which of course is in the uh, eastern part of the center of historical center of Paris, the uh, full name is the Bastille Saint Antoine. Bastille Saint Antoine. Saint Antoine. Okay. And uh, for the simple reason that uh, it was a uh, fortress, a fortress originally built in uh, the uh, 1370s. Mm -hmm. by uh, the king at the time, uh, King uh, Charles V. Don't have to remember very much about that. Charles that... Quint, right? Is how we... No, no, no. Charles Quint is somebody else. It's another one. Okay. Oh, that's Charles Quint is another one. He's the bad guy. He's the enemy on the other side of the Pyrenees. Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. See, yeah. I really need to do these podcasts. Yeah, I, you, I don't you, know you anything. Do. You do. <laughs> anyway, there was a king named Charles V uh, who was uh, one of the king's... Uh, after Philippe Auguste, who decided it was time to reinforce the city of Paris. And uh, there are some wonderful illustrations, which we will put on the podcast, that show what Paris looked like in that time, and that was the countryside. I right, mean, and, and I'll put all of these on joinusinfrance.com and forward slash 24, the number 24. So the, it, he, he wanted to reinforce the eastern uh, ramparts of what was at the time the city, which is much, much smaller, of course, than what the city of Paris looks like now. So if you can imagine that the Seine River runs largely east-west, and we're talking about the eastern side of the old city center just north of the Seine River, just, just north of the Seine River. Okay. And there, there are ramparts and he wants to reinforce them. And he wants to reinforce them for two reasons. Uh, one, to defend the city from invaders, which is mm -hmm. very noble of him. <laughs> uh, and there's a, a major gateway, the Saint Antoine d'Or gateway, which is why the uh, uh, Bastille there is called the Bastille Saint Antoine, uh -huh. because it leads to an area that was based on the name of a monastery, Saint Antoine. Okay. Uh, and uh, the other reason is less noble, and that is that he had himself uh, a castle built in the Parc de Vincennes, the area of Vincennes, which is directly east of the city of Paris. It's on the outskirts of the official city. Mm -hmm. There's a huge chateau. It's a fortified castle from that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he had that castle built uh, because he was not a very, very popular king. Mm. And there were uprisings. And he wanted to make sure uh, that by building this uh, Bastille with, uh, with a gateway, he could have his soldiers protecting the doorway, and in case he was at that time spending some residence days in his uh, Chateau de Vincennes, uh, they would close off the gates and protect him on the outside of the city oh, as I well see. as on the inside. I see. So it's very interesting. But um, in fact, it was a fabulous uh, example of medieval fortified architecture. The original structure was built in a rectangular form with a tower in each corner. Mm -hmm. And then it was, uh, uh, it was enlarged and uh, four other towers were actually added on. And the entranceway in and out uh, was the Saint Antoine doorway. So it was really a gateway in and out of Paris in the 1300s. Mm -hmm. It looks like, it, to me, when I saw the pictures, it looked like a, a fort... Like something a kid would build. Yeah. If a little kid was making a like the stereotypical fort. The medieval fortified it, castle. Yeah, it kind of looks like that. Well, it, it? it was. And in fact, it was built to be a, a military castle. But it was also, interestingly enough, and that is why part of the neighborhood is still named after it. It was also built as an arsenal. 
Mm. It was not built as a residence and it was not originally built as a prison either. Mm -hmm. So it was built simply as a fortified, fortified military uh, structure. And of course, at that time, all structures were uh, fortified with ramparts. I mean, nothing was built yeah. without walls because it was uh, the 14th century, and that's well. We still have that craze in France. We still do fences everywhere. That's true. Uh, that, you know, that's true. That, that's connected to. It's I very. Think a, it's very unusual. It's an avatar of ancient times. Yeah, I think, uh, French know? people put fences around everything, everything. and they they're really do. very often brick fences. I mean, it's uh, and you gateways. See, yeah, yeah, and gateways and all of that. We still do that now. Because it, it it has to do with what happens later on, uh, it's interesting to know that uh, the eight towers all had names, but the tower we're interested in is called Liberty Tower, mm. and this is a name that was given to this tower starting in uh, the end of the 1300s. So it's not a, a recent name, uh, and there's speculation, and I find this kind of fun because no one knows exactly and two two possible reasons are given for the fact that it was given this name and one was uh that it was pure sarcasm uh that it was in fact uh <laughs> Uh, mostly because it was one of these towers where, in fact, prisoners were uh, being thrown because after a very short time, it was decided that some of the towers in this structure, which you have to remember is a structure that has a huge open courtyard on the inside and is a series of these fortified towers uh, with walls around them, that one of these was, in fact, a, a place where people were basically thrown in. But, in fact, what the, the Bastille was used for afterwards belies that and and the other, uh, which actually seems more likely, was that it was the tower where uh, people with a certain amount of privilege were being put once they were put uh, inside as prisoners. And I'll explain why mm. later on. But what happens is that this structure, which basically is the landmark structure on the eastern side of medieval Paris... Uh, it goes through various evolutions, and there are not so much in terms of its structure. We talked about the Louvre and how it was changed in terms of its size and how things were added on over and over and over. Mm -hmm. But with the Bastille, in fact, mostly it was changed in terms of its function. Uh, the structure itself didn't change very much. So what happened was that over a few centuries, different kings decided to use it in different ways. So uh, it was an arsenal, and then it became, at certain times, a place where the kings put their royal treasure. Mm. And they decided that it was a good place to put the treasure because it had all of these wonderful towers that were 24 mm -hmm. meters high. And it was safe. It was safe. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a good place to put all of the uh, riches that they had. Mm -hmm. And under uh, some kings, and one of them... Uh, King, we've mentioned a few times, and we'll talk a lot about again in the near future, Henry IV, mm -hmm. it did indeed for a while become a treasury, and then it became a prison. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, almost exclusively, it was used as a place for political prisoners. Mm. So it was, there were, in Paris, starting way, way back even, there were uh, prisons, uh, what the French like to call a cachot, yeah. for Common criminals. Right. You would not have wanted to be in one. These were dingy <laughs> holes that were basically underground <laughs> yeah. where sure. people were thrown in in masses. There was no evacuation. There was no sanitation. There was no air. They were horrible. And many people would just die in them. Mm. Uh, they, were, they were really the worst imaginable kind of place you could think of in terms mm. of a prison. Mm. The Bastille was not like that. Mm. And in fact... Starting in the beginning, it was designed to hold 45 prisoners, this entire huge structure. Huh. Why? Because these were the upper class political prisoners. I see. What does that mean? That means that a prisoner was usually a noble person. Mm -hmm. They were sent to prison, not necessarily for an extremely long time. And when they were sent to prison in the Bastille, they went to prison with their servants. Ah. And they <laughs> went to prison with their books, and they were served regular meals. They oh. were served the same food as the governor of the Bastille, which was an extremely important function. It was given to a major nobleman. 
Hmm. And all of that uh, was because this was a place that was designated as being for uh, nobles who were either doing a little bit of plotting or sometimes said the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. There were even people as important as Voltaire later on in the 1700s. Was he thrown in there? He was thrown in there because at one point he either, I can't remember if it's that he said or wrote something that did not please Well, he did that a lot. And so he spent (laughs) several months in the Bastille. I see. Uh, And uh, we have... So that was a posh prison. It it was a posh prison. Hang on, hang on. At the beginning, you said it wasn't built to be a prison. It wasn't built to be a prison. It was built to be a military defensive fort. But then soon after that, it became a prison. It became... Charles V uh, had a son who was crazy, (laughs) named Charles VI. Um, Uh There was a series of different kings. Then the dynasty changed. And what happened was... If you can imagine that uh, something that was a fortified military structure in the 1300s gets to be, by 150, 200 years later, a little bit outdated. Right. And so uh, nobody really wants to use it anymore. And also Paris expands. And its eastern front moves a little further east. Mm -hmm. So it is no longer like something we mentioned when we talked about Carcassonne. It's no longer on the edge of the city. Right, right. And so its military function winds up being less important. I see. Okay. And since it has been built with these eight incredible cylindrical towers. Perfect for a prison. All have three or four floors in them. Mm -hmm. And they're very high. Mm -hmm. It's perfect uh, to divide up uh, basically per floor almost mm-hmm. uh, one or two spaces and make it into a prison. Okay. And as I mentioned, alternately, it was left empty with some military people and simply used as a treasury. And that a couple of times in this history, in fact, at the times closer up to the time of the revolution, it was used as a place to depose the archives. Mm. So a couple of the towers were actually uh, places where all of the magnificent uh, documents that were the documents that covered the history of Paris and the history of the kings were deposed. And they were were kept there as as a way of keeping them safe. Okay, okay. So basically, it's, it's this structure. However, because, interestingly enough, and we all know this, if you ask anybody, and I think it's not anybody just in France, but anybody who knows anything about the history of France, everybody does, in fact, associate the Bastille with the revolution. Oh, yes. And, and, and people think of it as a place where it must be the place that was the nastiest, that had the worst history and all of this because of that association. Mm-hmm. But interestingly enough, the reason why we do associate it with the revolution is because it was mostly for political prisoners. I can't, okay. So it wasn't, in, in fact, I was surprised when I was looking up some of the statistics, very few people were killed there, hmm. very few, and <laughs> very few people spent more than a couple of years there. Well, yeah. And so it was not the worst place to be. Uh, oh, yeah, they often. served you meals and stuff. and But, you know, it was the kind of place. Servants. For instance, if you were, and this happened a few times, if you were a, a brother or a cousin of the king and you were discovered to be plotting against. A bit of a threat. A bit of a threat. Well, they would put you in this prison yeah. and then decide whether they needed to exile you or send you banished to the other end of the kingdom or stuff like that. Yeah. So it it, it became symbolic of a place where there was a certain authority. Now, all this is true up until the very beginning of the 1600s, that we're in the 17th century. So this is really uh, about 250 years later. Okay. And we come to a time when there's a man who is basically extremely interesting, but basically on a lot of levels, uh, pretty much of a bad guy in certain ways. And that is the Cardinal Richelieu. Ah, yes, Richelieu, yes. Now, Richelieu was an incredibly interesting man, and I'm not going to go into his life story, but he was uh, the prime minister and the man who decided everything during the reign of uh, Louis XIII. Mm. And Louis XIII is the son of Henry IV, the man who had turned the Bastille into a treasury for a while. Uh, the problem with Cardinal Richelieu is that when Louis XIII 
after his father, the King Henry IV, is assassinated, he's a minor, and it's his mother who is regent in his place. Right. She places her entire trust in this man, Cardinal Richelieu, who is, in fact, a duke. He is actually noble of birth. Yeah. And who is both a cardinal and prime minister. And uh, he is the man who conceives of the idea, politically, of the notion of absolute monarchy. Mm. And so, in order to create this idea, he devises something that is called uh, the cachet. And the cachet means literally uh, that a letter signed by the king, which in fact was really signed by him, mm. would mean that anybody could be arrested and thrown into prison without any due process of mm. any court. So cachet, can you spell that? Cachet. Oh, cachet. Cachet. Yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, they call it so C A C H E T. Yeah, the cachet. It was so it's a, like the stamp, the royal stamp. stamp. Okay, but it was a special. Uh, they called it a special cachet, and it was something that he invented. And and there are some examples of it. In fact, in uh, a couple of the museums, like the Museum de Canavale, which I'm going to talk about when we talk about the Marais, which is a museum of the history of Paris, mm -hmm. and uh, he uh, had um, a Catherine de Medici who was the mother of Louis XIII, she signed paper giving him absolute authority to do all these things while Louis XIII was a kid, was so a child. So he could do whatever he, he wanted. He could do whatever he wanted. Yeah. And he created uh, the idea of raison d'état, which mm. is still used in uh, yes. France. Uh, raison d'état well, means... Not uh, only in France. Not only in France, but yeah. it's actually a doctrine uh, that is talked about uh, when you read uh, articles about political activity in France, mm -hmm. which basically means that if it's to preserve the government and the country, now we would say, uh, you can do certain things that are basically things you're not supposed to do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to put it uh, mildly. Yes. And so what happened was that under uh, Richelieu, uh, with this idea of the cachet secret, people started being thrown into prison and the prison they were thrown into was the Bastille. Ah, yes. Now, one of the most wonderful things to do if you're interested in this time period and leading up to, of course, not just this period, which is, of course, the early 1600s, but from this time on going up to the revolution is read A Tale of Two Cities. Huh. Read A Tale of Two Cities. I read it two summers ago when I was convalescing from mm -hmm. surgery. I have always loved Dickens. I had never in my life read this book before. I have never enjoyed a book so much in my life. <laughs> it is wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. But does it have to do with France? It has to do with the French Revolution and it has to do with the Bastille. Ah. And it starts out with these famous lines, it was the best of worlds, it was the worst of worlds. No, it was the best of times. Best of times, Sorry, the best, best of times. And it goes back and forth between Paris and London and a lot of it takes place in and around the Bastille. And he describes in wonderful detail the neighborhood of Saint Antoine and all of the people who worked at the Bastille and the things around it. So go out and get a version of Dickens' The Tale of Two Cities. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. So basically what happens is that over a period of several centuries, starting with Richelieu, there is a notion that this is a prison that represents an abuse of power. Mm. However, there were never that many people in this prison. This is not where most of the prisoners right. were going. And so what happens is that by the time that we get to the 1770s, there are people who actually want to close the prison down, and it's, it's now basically a prison anyway, and, and destroy it. This mm, is another mm. one of these buildings where there was a big move on to simply tear it down. It's from the 1300s. We're in the 1770s. Oh, it's yeah. old. It's yeah. over 400 years old. Yeah. It's a prison. Um, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get yeah. rid of it. There, the, the neighborhood that it's in, if you walk three blocks Further west, you're in the Marais, which is filled with these magnificent mansions that are all from the 1600s and early 1700s. And right. Who wants to be reminded of this old, uh, sordid time? Nobody in the wants past? a prison in the Nobody wants a prison yeah, anymore. Okay. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And it was originally surrounded by ditches, which of course stank. Uh, yeah. So it was really a weird place because there were even little commerce, you know, there was these little shops because. You have people who would come to visit prisoners and something else. 
uh, because this was a prison for political prisoners, there was a reg- a rule that the guards standing outside the prison and the shopkeepers could not look and the prisoners were delivered at night to the prison and the guards were required to blindfold themselves. <laughs> the shops, of course, at night were all closed. It was usually between midnight and one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And the prisoners were taken in in a way so with a, a with a black cloth over their heads so, nobody so knew that nobody were. knew who they were. Ah. And they believed that the story of the man um, in, of the iron, in the Iron Mask right. c- comes from the fact that the prisoners, when they were brought into the prison, were unknown. And of course, you know, there is to conjecture to this day who this person really was right, because right. eventually he was sent to an island prison off the coast of Marseille. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but that is really what the rule was. So mm. uh, be, these were very important people. One of the most important people uh, but who was actually a bit crazy and who spent four years there and escaped the revolution simply because he was evacuated out of the prison a few months before was Marquis de Sade. Oh. Four years in there, huh? Four years. He was one of the people who stayed in this prison the longest. He had time to think about all sorts of things. All sorts of things (laughs) that we're not going to talk about today in any event, right? Uh, So what happens is that uh, the the revolution is uh, beginning, uh, and there's this eruption uh, of activity in the city, and other buildings have been seized. And, of course, we have the masses of people. This is why reading A Tale of Two Cities is wonderful, because it's an, an evocation of, of what it was like when the masses finally revolted. That's absolutely incredible to read. Hmm. And in this area around the Bastille, this area that was now called the um, Faubourg, the, uh, pardon, the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, yes, which is an area filled with uh, merchants and people who made cloth and people who made furniture. And uh, these are not the poorest of people, but this is a, a people's area. It's a right, very popular right. area. Uh, when the word spreads that various buildings are being uh, sieged, besieged mm-hmm. for the revolution, mm-hmm. the people in that particular area decide that it's time to take over the Bastille. Mm. because it has come to represent this notion of absolute power and abuse. Mm-hmm. But believe it or not, on the 14th of July, when they do indeed do this, there are only seven people left in the entire building. Oh, yeah. So, it... And two of them are absolutely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and they were put in there because they were noble men who were... Uh, insane yeah. and their families basically had put them in there as a temporary thing because they were trying to figure out literally what, what to, to do. do with them. Yeah, yeah. And so they were sent away because they were dangerous. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and so basically what you have then is this mass of hundreds of people with pitchforks and uh, sticks and <laughs> knives and a few of them with guns because they know that there is, in fact, a depot still with gunpowder in one of the sure. towers in the Bastille. Sure. And one of the reasons they want to take it is because they want the gunpowder. Mm-hmm. And so they storm the Bastille. Mm-hmm. By this time, it was relatively easy. There were hardly any guards left. And they, was <laughs> poor, they let these poor seven prisoners out. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea what happened to the two who were insane, but they were freed. They were just simply opened the doors of the prison. Yeah. And on the next day, on the 15th, they started to tear the Bastille down. Right. And interestingly enough, the Bastille in and of itself was not the center of the hatred of the people in terms of the, the king's palace, uh, the, the, the cathedral and all these other things. But because they wanted the stones from the building well, yeah. and they wanted the gunpowder. And this is what happened. This is absolutely incredible. I had no idea until I was doing some of the research. They s- tore down the building and every last piece of stone was taken by people. And very often the people resold them as souvenirs of the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> some of the pieces had carving on them. Uh, some of them, yeah. they actually carved things into. 
there were some people who actually made a fortune by gathering up pieces of the stone and selling them to people during the revolution as souvenirs of the taking of the Commerce. Bastille. Commerce, right? <laughs> the Marquis de Lafayette, who was a very interesting man. Yes. Now, uh, some of us from the States know that he was a person who had come to visit the uh, Americans during the American uh, War of Independence, the American mm -hmm. Revolution, and he had become a, a fervent admirer of what happened in the United States, and he was one of the people responsible for convincing various other noblemen, because he was truly a nobleman, to participate in a revolution and make a democracy. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the people, by the way, responsible for making the French flag red, white, and blue mm. in honor of the American flag. Well, there you go. And now he took a piece of sculpted vault keystone from the Bastille and sent it as a present to George Washington. Oh, how nice. Isn't that nice? And what did George Washington do with it? It's in uh, Mount Vernon. Oh. Would you believe this? It's actually in Mount Vernon. Oh, nice. I'm going to have to see if I can find You're it. You're going to have to see if you can there. find it. Yeah. Unfortunately for the Marquis de Lafayette, mm. who was a brilliant, brilliant young man, it did not prevent him from losing his head during the terror. Yes. And he was truly a man who believed in democracy. Mm. So mm. Uh, it, it was very strange. But can you imagine? So the Bastille, all that was left was several different foundations of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, there is uh, uh, one spot in a tiny little pocket park, you can call it, that is just south of the, what is now the Place de la Bastille, right along the banks of the Seine River, mm -hmm. where they have taken the stones from one of the corner towers that were actually retrieved and dug up when they were building one of the metro lines in the 1890s. Okay. And, you know, the metro in Paris is the oldest in the world. And it was started in 1890. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they took these three layers of rounded stone that mm -hmm. were the base of one of the towers. And uh, they moved them away because it was uh, in the line of uh, metro line number one. Uh -huh. yeah. And they put them in this little mini park. And right in the middle of this little triangle of grass, you have the three cylindrical base layers of one of the towers of the Bastille. Hmm. So what happened was this, that the, it took less than a week for the entire structure to be dismounted, to, to be taken oh, yeah. down. If you have enough people who want the stones, it's going to go pretty quickly. It's, it, it's, it's really quite amazing. And, and what happened, of course, is that this is the date that is considered to be the symbolic beginning of the revolution, even though it, it started a little bit before that. But it had be it became very soon afterwards officially the beginning of the French Revolution. So we're mm -hmm. talking about July 14th, 1789. Right. What happened was, of course, that the revolution takes place. A year later, exactly one year later, on July 14th, 1790, hmm. the Federation or Republic is declared. Okay. Okay? And basically, the revolution... Uh, goes along, I don't know what the right word to use is, uh, without disintegrating into the terror for another couple of years. Right. And then, of course, in 1793, we have the beginning of the massive number of uh, beheadings and the guillotining of the king and the guillotining of, of even the people who are moderates in the revolution. But see, in my mind, I was, I was picturing that they had beheaded people in the Bastille. No. But obviously not. It was torn down It by was then. torn down. And not only that, but uh, interesting to know that uh, when the um, beheadings began, Uh, there were a first, there were a few that were on the spot of what had been the Bastille. Mm. And uh, people decided that that was not the right spot for them. <laughs> and so it was simply moved. Can you um, imagine? It was This moved. morning I'm thinking about where the right spot for beheading yes, is. Yes, well, that, that is awful. exactly what they did. They moved yeah. it first to a, 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 a square. And now, of course, you know, when we use the word square, you have to be careful because we're using the word square because in English, we don't really have the idea of a place because in fact, at the Bastille, it's not even a square. It's round. Mm -hmm. uh, there are others that are rectangular. There are some that are triangular, but basically the 
concept of a square means a big open space with mm-hmm. intersecting streets of various kinds. Uh, where the Bastille was becomes one of these big open spaces, which to this day is still the Place de la Bastille. Right. And right away after the building was torn down, it becomes a place for people to gather and for celebration at first connected to the revolution. So one of the traditions that began literally on July 14th of 1790, not 89, but 1790, Mm -hmm. is something called the Dance of the Bastille. Mm. And it exists still to this day. Mm. I would assume that the only time that it didn't happen was during the occupation, during World War II. Mm. Every year on the 14th of July, the entire Plaza de Bastille is closed off Mm -hmm. and there is a huge... Ball. There's a huge oh, bal populaire, populaire. P- bal populaire yeah. out in the open on the Place de la Bastille. And cool. that dates back to July 14th, 1790, when they declared the Republic in France. So if you want to see French people having fun and you're in Paris <laughs> around the 14th of July, go to Place de la Bastille. Go to Place de la Bastille. However, what is interesting to know is that it... The 14th of July was not declared a national holiday until, believe it or not, 1880. Hmm. So 1880. It was much, much, later. much later. Yeah. And of course, the reason is, uh, is that the history of France was extremely complicated between 1790 and uh, this 1870 mm-hmm. because you have the revolution, then you have Napoleon taking over, right. then you have the restoration of a king, mm-hmm. then you have a Napoleon coming back, mm-hmm. then there's another restoration of a king, then there's a republic, and it goes on and on and on like that yeah. until 1870, unfortunately for the people of Paris. Yeah. They suffered a lot. And uh, I'm going to talk about that in a second because, uh, so what we have is a Bastille, which is a symbol. It's a symbol right, right. of the French Revolution. Nobody sees anything starting in the year 1789, basically, in July. That's it. It's gone. The walls of Paris still are standing, parts of the walls. Mm -hmm. Parts of the gates of Saint Antoine are actually uh, still standing. They were not taken down until quite a bit later. Uh, It's interesting because the whole idea of an arrondissement, which means a district, Mm -hmm. is also something that is from uh, the revolutionary times Mm -hmm. and Napoleon. Napoleon, Mm -hmm. who was very good at organizing departments, administrations. And so uh, at the Place of the Bastille, which is circular and very big, you actually have the uh, joining together of three of the uh, arrondissements or neighborhood districts in Paris. You have the 4th, the 11th, and the 12th. Okay. They all join together. If you are in a helicopter above the (laughs) actual center of the Place de la Bastille, you will see 11, 11 streets or big, broad boulevards entering into the big Place de la Bastille. Mm -hmm. Missing one. The Concorde has 12. Uh, the Place de la Bastille has actually 11. By the Concorde, you mean la place de la, the Place de la Concorde, place de la Concorde right? Yes. But what you will see right in the center of the Place de la Bastille, dead center, is a huge column. Yes. And that column, believe it or not, was erected uh, by uh, the last uh, king, if you will, Louis Philippe, who was considered to be king of the people of France. He was the Republican king who was uh, there in the 1850s. And it was in commemoration of a strange event that actually happened in 1830. So it is not even in a commemoration of the French Revolution per se. Mm. But in the year 1830, for three days, also in July, something must be special in the month of July. Mm. I don't know why. On the 27th, 28th, and 29th of July in 1830, there was a popular uprising Mm. in Paris because uh, a king had been put back on the throne who was Charles VIII, who was a descendant of the cousin of the king, Louis XVI, and he was extremely unpopular because he had appointed a whole group of people 
who were very, very, very strict monarchists, and the people who had accepted the idea of a king being put back in place wanted basically a figurehead king, like in England. Mm -hmm. And when they saw who was being appointed to the government, yeah, like, no, there no. was a revolt. Yeah. And in fact, uh, mentioning others' cultural uh, things, Les Miserables yeah. takes place in 1830. And uh, if you don't want to read the book, go see the movie. Uh, in the movie, there is the scene of the revolt in 1830 when people barricade the city oh, in Paris. So that's what it is. That's I, what it I was. I knew it wasn't taking place during the actual revolution. That's right. But I didn't know what it was. Okay. That's exactly what it is. It's in honor of the th what they're called the Three Glorious Days. It, it, okay, I've heard that name too. Les Trois Glorieuses, right? Les Trois Glorieuses. Okay. It's in honor of the 800 people killed uh -huh. in that revolt. Mm -hmm. It did accomplish what it was going to accomplish, which is that uh, the uh, uh, sort of King Charles VIII uh, was forced to abdicate mm -hmm. and somebody else was put in his place, uh, Louis de Philippe, who was much more popular. Mm -hmm. And so that statue, which was actually inaugurated in 1840, uh, is in honor not of the revolution per se, but of that revolt of 1830. Oh, but what's yeah. interesting, because uh, a few months ago when I was uh, visiting the Marais with some people, I walked them over because everybody wanted to see the Place de la Bastille. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I said, you know, you're not going to see anything about the actual Bastille building. I said, but let's talk about this column because it's really quite uh, impressive to see. Yeah. And in a sense, it's really about the idea of freedom uh, because it, it's really representative of the fact that the people were revolting against mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. But um, something that was supposed to be put there but never was, which I think is, again, we go back to Napoleon. Napoleon, who was amazing in his megalomania, um, he had come back from his campaigns in... Uh, Egypt and uh, somewhere in, the, in the, those territories out there. Mm -hmm. And he decided, you're going to laugh. I mean, this is a new one. Um, he decided that uh, in the middle of this big open Place de la Bessie, which if you can imagine in the 1800s was not paved as it is now or anything like that, but mm. was this big open public space, he was going to erect a monument in the form of an elephant. An elephant. Yes, yes. Why not? Why not? Why and not? He was going to erect a mm -hmm. huge monument in the form of an elephant with the, the, you know, the kind of cage seat that they put on top of it when you're a Maharaja in India to sit oh, on yeah, and everything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Because he wanted to evoke his his conquerings to the east, you know, the eastern part of the Mediterranean and, well, that and, and all that. would have probably looked grand, I guess. It would have looked grand. It would have probably looked a little bit silly, I can't imagine. But since he did bring back the obelisk that was yeah. 3,000 years old and put it up on the Place de la Concorde, why, uh, not? why not, right? Well, it never got put up. Um, it, it was... Uh, it was a uh, want, yeah. want of, of uh, stability in his government and whatever other reasons. Uh, somebody finally convinced him or the government that this was not necessarily such a good idea. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank goodness, instead of that, we do have this uh, column that, that is in commemoration of the revolution. Well, that's now, really interesting. Uh, just a few things about the Place de la Bastille today. Mm. Uh, it's a bustling, bustling, bustling yes. area. It is the conjunction Noisy. of, as I mentioned, three arrondissements. The fourth, which is the Marais, and it's something we're going to talk about very soon. Mm. You can walk to the Place de la Bastille from even City Hall. You just follow along the Seine River, or you go through the Marais on uh, Rue de Saint-Antoine, mm -hmm. and you come up to the uh, Place de la Bastille. You have the 11th and the 12th, which are... Uh, popular and have become very, very, very chic. Mm. Uh, the 11th arrondissement is filled with art galleries and places. It's a very big hangout area for basically the 20 to 40 age crowd. Uh, lots of very uh, cool bars, uh, bookstores, mm. restaurants, uh, lots of little hotels. It's not famous for its hotels in that area, but wonderful, wonderful places to go and hang out. And of course, since uh, 1989, on the Place de la Bastille is the Opera House. Right. And this Opera House is the new, modern, apparently with totally perfect acoustics, 
very ugly on the outside, <laughs> opera house, that is really where operas are performed because the old opera house, the Opera Garnier, is now used almost exclusively for ballet. Mm, mm. But uh, if you want to go to the opera, you go to the opera at Place de la Bastille. Mm. And uh, the, the other In thing... Building. Is that it, it, if you walk around the, the, the place, which means crossing over many, many of these boulevards and it's very, very busy and all of that, you will notice that uh, right across from uh, the opera house is a canal. Okay. And the canal is the Canal Saint-Martin. Mm -hmm. And it is a little canal. It's not that little. It's actually about three kilometers long. Okay. That connects the Seine River to a basin called the uh, Basin of La Villette, okay. which is in uh, the northern part of Paris, which originally was built as a source of uh, water for the city. Okay. And uh, the, the canal itself was built in uh, the middle of the 1800s. Okay. And uh, was built as a source of navigation for boats to bring things from the northern part of Paris, uh, specifically coal and wood and things like that. Heavy but things? Heavy things. So it's, it's a big uh, canal, but it was built on the place where the arsenal part of the Bastille was. I see. And so uh, when they dug it up, uh, they paid tribute to it. If you actually uh, walk around and drive or drive by, you will see there's a place with a sign that says this is the place that was the arsenal of the Bastille. And there's one other thing. Now, I haven't seen this, but apparently... If you take the number one metro line, which is the direct east-west line that goes from uh, Vincennes all the way out to um, La Défense on, mm -hmm. on the western side, apparently, if you have very good eyes and if you stand near the windows, as you pull into the stop at La Bastille, there is underground where they were digging out uh, the metro uh, in 1890. There's a plaque that indicates where they found the foundation of the Bastille. Hmm. So I'm going to have to get back on the number one line since I'm going to be yeah. back up there in a couple of days. Uh, and I'm going to go see if I can find this. Find it. They said uh, you have to be on a train. Uh, most of the trains. Do you know which side? Uh, I think it's on the north side. But okay. I'm, but I'm <laughs> not actually. Well, it should be theoretically on the north side, but I'm not absolutely sure. But, so this uh, is what Elise is going to be doing the last, next few days. <laughs> this is the next few days. Get right. on the uh, metro. I'm going to go back and forth on the one. Right. Until she finds right. that. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, it's also, just to mention the J July 14th, because of course we're going to put this podcast on in honor of the 14th, um, it was on the f 14th of July uh, that the convention, that is the revolutionary uh, committee, if you want to call it that, the ruling body, adopted the uh, Marseillaise as the official song mm -hmm. of, of the French uh, Revolution, which of course has become the official him uh, right. of the French. Right. And uh, so the, the 14th of July is, is a very, very important date. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just mention a couple of things. Uh, the Gay Pride Parade begins on the Place de la Bastille, mm. started in the uh, 1980s, and always starts there and goes through the city. It's a very, very big, very popular event. Yeah. Um, there every single Sunday afternoon, starting at 2.30... And this also has been going on for, a, I think, about 20 years. There is a huge, huge gathering of people on roller skates <laughs> or roller blades. Uh, and the streets are closed off along the Seine River. Beginning at the Place de la you can do 20 kilometers. I have never done it, but I've watched it go by. <laughs> and believe me, it's lots and lots and lots of people. Roller skaters. Roller skaters and blade skaters that go out uh, from, from the Bastille and uh, skate along the Seine and go west along the Seine. So do they block traffic or is it... They block traffic. They uh -huh. completely uh, close off the traffic. Uh, there's one road along the Seine River that's completely closed off. Mm -hmm. uh, Sunday afternoon in Paris is, uh, is fun. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's not to completely closed down because there are lots of places, of course, that are open. But uh, there are lots of fun things that happen on the weekends uh, mm -hmm. in Paris. Uh, and just to mention that along a couple of the big boulevards of these 11 big streets that, that circle out and spokes from the Place de la Bastille, you have two or three that are lined with some of the most famous brasserie restaurants mm. uh, in Paris. 
uh, I don't know if I should mention any of them specifically, but well, uh, there's one that you like. You can there, there is one because it's famous for its choucroute, which I know actually you yeah, like, yeah, and yeah. that is the Bowfinger, uh, the Bowfinger, as you would call it if it were speaking B O F I N G E R. Okay, uh, and it's very, very famous. Uh, and also, just one last thing for people out there who read mystery books: if you've ever read any of the uh, um, the Magray mystery stories, yeah. He lives in the books, of course, because it's George Simenon who wrote them, who lived in Switzerland almost his entire life. But Commissaire Magré lived on, or lives, I guess he's, he's forever immortal, yeah. on the Boulevard Richard Lenoir, mm. right off Place de la Bastille. Well, there you go. So there you go. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's not only a place that has a great hi- symbolic and historical importance, even though people don't know the exact details, but it's, to this day, a really wonderful, fun place to visit in right, Paris. Right, right. And if you come to France around uh, July 14th, there's so many events that you can, you know, go to. And lots of fireworks. Right. Fireworks everywhere. Every major city. It doesn't matter where you are. Now, if you're in a small village, probably nothing much is going to happen. But if you go to the big cities, there are going to be concerts, fireworks, uh, all sorts of things. They, the, the cities do spend a fair amount of uh, money and, you know, trying it's to fun. make it interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and just, you know, if you're in Paris, uh, the Bastille, the area around the Bastille is really a place you can almost walk to from anywhere within the central circle of, of arrondissement in Paris. But otherwise, you have three metros that go there. And uh, zillions of buses. I can't mm-hmm. even mention the names of the buses. Yeah. But you have lines one, five, and eight on the metro, and it's really easy. To yeah, get to. yeah, yeah. And another thing that happens in Paris, of course, on the fourteenth of July, is the military parade, and um, that's on the Champs Elysees. That's on the Champs Elysees. I have found lots of very fun pictures uh, uh, of that, um, and I'll put them up on the on the website. Uh, with this episode you remind me that uh in the beginning they wanted to have the military parades actually start at the place de la bastille oh really yeah and then it got changed uh to the Mm champs-elysees and i'm not sure if it was for military reasons that made it a little bit safer or whether it was simply that they wanted to move it to a part of the city where it was less associated with the bad parts of the revolution because Maybe. that is in fact that in fact oh yes and one last thing that was what i was going to say that i forgot that the um uh the national holiday on the 14th of july uh when it was proposed in 1880 there were many many of the deputies in the french parliament who were opposed to uh, the 14th of July because they said that for many people it was associated with the terror, with the guillotining. And so there was a negotiation done, and they said, well, no, it's not because of the 14th of July of 1789. It's because of the 14th of July of 1790 when the Republic was declared. So officially, if you look up the documents in France, the reason why the national holiday is the 14th of July is not because of 1789. It's because of 1790. Well, okay. You know, yeah. That that works for me. That works for me. They, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's the same day anyway, It's the right? same day. And who remembers all these dates? Well, you do, but... <laughs> I do. But, uh, I do. Like an elephant. Yeah. I should have been the, like the elephant, of Napoleon's elephant. No. Yeah. Oh, it's terrible. I'm so bad with all these things. But I learn lots of things. And it's good to know because it gives you some background. And when you see these places. It's... Oh, yes. And to go back to the spoiler at the beginning, which, of course, now that you, you, because you said it, I actually thought it is true that uh, traced on the floor, on the, on the, on the street, pavement. on the pavement, is the outline of the fortress of the Bastille. Right. It's but like cobblestones. You have to be stones. careful because there are cars going by all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and they're crazy over there. So don't, yeah. But that is the, the way they show you where it was. I'll, I'll put a picture of that also on the right. website. So go to join us in France forward slash 24 and you'll find lots of pictures of things that we've talked about. So we just have to say to everybody, happy Bastille Day. Uh, yes, happy Bastille Day. And we don't wish happy Bastille Day in French. Uh, no, not at all. In America, you would say happy 4th. That's right. But in French, you don't wish people anything. It's, no, you don't wish people anything. It's, it's just a, a day to not work. Yeah, it's a day where you take the day off. And, and the military shows its power. 
Yes. I mean, my pe- people, my parents' generations, they, they never went to the parade uh, in town, in the city, but they always watched it on TV. Yep. A lot of people still do. You know, um, I have um, people who are officers in the French army. It's a great honor to be, uh, you know... On the, uh, on, on the, the stands, right. on the stands, or even um, de- defile, you know, do oh, participate. Right. And they usually have a, a foreign power invited uh, to send soldiers to participate. Mm-hmm. I can't remember which country it was last year. It's a very big military show. Yeah, Let's put it that way. It's a big show. In yeah. the states, on the Fourth of July, we have that, but we have also the tradition of the barbecue and mm-hmm. all of that. Uh, the biggest honor you can have in France is to be invited to the garden party at the Elysee Palace, which is the president's palace, which is kind of like being invited to the the egg hunting party for <laughs> Easter at the White House. <laughs> Not quite the same in that sense. It's a little bit fancier, actually, at the yeah, yeah. Elysee Palace. But it is true that it's a very big event in that way. Yeah, yeah, it's a big event. And you can see, you will see military parades in every major city in France. And people still watch them, but and they watch them. But for the most part, uh, you know, it's a, it's a day to relax, go to a concert. Usually, there's open air events, uh, fireworks at night. That's what I look forward to. It's yeah, the fireworks. Yeah, that's what I love. Yeah, and this year I'm I'm gonna try to see the fireworks in Carcassonne, like you recommended. Um, <gasps> I won't be here, but. I will. How? <laughs> and I'll have my camera. Maybe I can oh make, boy. take some good pictures. You will, my dear. Yes. Bet. Anyway, lovely talking to you. Thank you very much for educating me. Oh. <laughs> no, I don't know anything. I mean, it's really bad. It's really bad. I, I don't know very much. Oh, so. you do. You know more than you think you do. Yeah. You but do. I, could, I certainly couldn't rattle it off like you do. Oh, no. Not without making major mistakes. No, but you rattle off about the technical stuff. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Happy 14th of July. That's not a very French thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Happy 14th of July, everybody. And we will talk to you next week. Au revoir. Bye. Thank you.